Hi, and welcome to a very short introduction. From ancient Greece to branding, globalisation to Homer, and logic to fashion, we'll showcase a concise and dynamic insight into a range of diverse topics for wherever your curiosity may lead you. So here is today's very short introduction. Hello, I'm Paul Cartledge. I'm A.G. Lavendi's Senior Research Fellow at Clare College, Cambridge, and previously I was the A.G. Lavendi's Professor of Greek Culture in Cambridge University. So I have written, it's now some while ago, and it's um, one of the series called Ancient Greece, a very short introduction, slightly longer than the normal book in this series because it was originally published unusually as a hardback. So I was allowed just a few more words. The title Ancient Greece is um, in a way an obvious one, but on the other hand, it's um, problematic. And I sometimes, partly as a joke, say there was no such thing as ancient Greece. And by that, I mean that there was no one thing. In other words, today we say Greece and we think of the state of Greece and it has boundaries and it's a political unit, an entity. Whereas in ancient Greece, there was no such single political entity. And in fact, there were about, we estimate, 1,000 separate ancient Greek communities scattered. Um, Plato uh, says it rather well, like frogs and ants around the pond, scattered all around, in other words, the Mediterranean and all around the Black Sea. And then when Alexander the Great takes on the Persian Empire, which extended as far as what's now India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, then Greece extended uh, as far east as that. So um, it's a very, very different sort of entity from anything we're used to in political terms. But there's another reason why there was no such thing as ancient Greece, because Greece, our English term, is derived from Latin, Graecia. And the Greeks never called themselves collectively Graecoi. There were some people called Graecoi, but they were very minor. Um, Greeks were Hellenes, Hellenes today, and they've always been Hellenes. And so what they thought of themselves as when they did think of themselves collectively was as Hellas. So if you add together all the Greek communities, mainland Greece, the Aegean heartland, and then spreading out around the Mediterranean, as far west as Marseille today, Massalia, and as far east as Thasis, which is in what's today Georgia, if you add them all together, you get Hellas. But Hellas is a cultural concept. So anyone who speaks Greek, who has Greek ancestors and a Greek ideology, the, the sense of belonging to a kind of super family, ultimately descended from gods and heroes, then that is Hellas. And you share both language and customs, and that differentiates you from everybody else. And everybody else are what they call barbarians, originally just a descriptive term, bar, 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 unintelligible language, but then coming to mean barbarous, barbaric. So Greeks developed a sense of solidarity, but also superiority, not necessarily so pleasant. And um, we might call it ethnocentricity. Some people would even say it's a kind of race but at any rate, um, that was what my general topic was. So how did I set about uh, tackling such a huge subject in terms of time? We're talking about a thousand odd years. And in terms of space, as I've already described, well, what I did was I selected just, a, well, in fact, a cricket team. That's a very English kind of concept, but 11, not 12 not 10 cities, which would in some sense encapsulate the development of Hellenism over that uh, thousand year period, and also capture the salient features, i.e. what I thought was most important about what the Greeks had to offer us and what indeed they achieved for themselves. So one of my favorite authors, in fact, he's my particular uh, favorite because he is my ultimate cultural ancestor, Herodotus, wrote a history of the Greco-Persian Wars, which uh, 
culminated at the beginning of the fifth century BC, BCE, before Christ or before the Common Era. And at one point in his work, he makes one of his uh, characters, the Athenians in fact, utter a kind of statement of what Hellas, what Hellenism was. And so in that sense, he captures uh, just a moment of what it was, a rare one, because normally Greeks fought each other more than they fought against uh, a common foreign enemy. They fought amongst themselves, Greek against Greek. So what were these extraordinary achievements? It's very difficult to be selective because they were so many. And um, you might perhaps be wondering, why do we still know anything about the Greeks or why do we care anything about the, the ancient Greeks at all? Well, it's actually largely due to the Romans. The Romans decided that the Greeks were their cultural ancestors, not their political models, but their cultural ancestors, what it was to do literature properly, to do philosophy, to do rhetoric. And of course, many of these words you'll notice are of Greek etymology. So it's through the Romans, then the Byzantines, and then ultimately the Renaissance, the Enlightenment to us, that we have what we know about ancient Greece. So let me just select um, a couple of aspects. One, politics. Well, democracy, Greek word, invented in the 5th century BC, BCE, probably at Athens, and certainly the Athenians were pioneers. They had the first version of it. They then developed more than one version. And, well, the rest, as they say, is history. Our democracy is, of course, very, very different from anything that they understood by democracy, but the word is the same. And so part of my interest as a historian is why is that word used when actually the thing, democracy, is very different as between both ancient Greece and the modern world and between, let's say, Athens and, let's say, Miletus in ancient Greece. Uh, other Greek cities had democracy, but of a different kind. Secondly, literature. Well, that's, of course, a Roman, a Latin-derived word. But the very fountain origin, the founder of Western, as we call it, literature, is, of course, a Greek, though we don't know who he or they actually were. It's one of the ironies. But Homer is the fountain origin of all Western literature, the Iliad, the Odyssey, massive epics, nearly 30,000 words, fantastic stories, brilliantly told, originally purely oral, then written down in the new Greek alphabet. And this is one of the interesting features to me about ancient Greece. Yes, they developed, they pioneered, but they couldn't have done it without the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, all kinds of non-Greek, especially Oriental foreigners, from whom they borrowed shamelessly, but then remade. So, for example, the alphabet. And then I'll conclude with this um, philosophy. Again, two ancient Greek words, philine to love and sophia, wisdom of some sort. A word apparently coined by Plato, and Plato was once said, a bit of a joke in a way, but that all Western philosophy was merely a series of footnotes to Plato. And I did philosophy myself at Oxford, half of my uh, degree, and I read in particular his Republic. And his most famous pupil was Aristotle, and I read Aristotle's Ethics, both in the original. And those two between them pretty much mopped up knowledge, uh, wisdom, such as it could be constituted before the huge technological developments of the Industrial Revolution and now the Digital Revolution, of which they couldn't even have dreamed. But nevertheless, they were, you know, for what they could do, given the technology of the day. And of course, given the attitudes of the day, I mean, it's a very sad fact, and this is one of the ways in which I find studying the ancient Greeks so fascinating. Aristotle was a fervent believer that there really were people who were slavish by nature, and therefore actually it was good for them to be made legally slaves. Well, we, or at least I hope we, most of us, all of us, find slavery, the very notion 
abhorrent. Once upon a time, it was taken for granted. Aristotle took it for granted, but he had also to argue for it, and he put forward extremely bad arguments. So the ancient Greeks are in many ways our cultural ancestors. Their society in many ways is very, very different. Apart from the attitudes to slavery, the other major fault line, the dark side of ancient Greece, if you like, is their attitude to women, whom they believed were by nature, by definition, inferior to all men, and whom they therefore, by and large, excluded from any kind of public political role. And since politics, the public sphere was so important to Greek men, that was a very major uh, exclusion. So that just about wraps up, I think, um, what I found most interesting about the ancient Greeks and how I constructed my, my book, starting with uh, the city of Knossos in Crete and ending with the city of Byzantion, uh, which then became Constantinople and then became and is today Istanbul. And so that served me as a kind of uh, link between the ancient and the medieval world and the modern world. How did I myself get interested in this, you might think, rather sort of rarefied and abstruse sphere? I can actually trace it. It's one of those rare cases where one looks back and one knows that there was a particular turning point, a moment in one's life that was determinative. And it was when I was eight years old, and I don't know why or how, but at any rate, I was given or I got hold of a copy of the two epics of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. But of course, I didn't read them in Greek, nor did I read them complete. There are 24 books of each of them. Uh, but I read a prose, very much stripped down version, and it was specifically called Told to the Children. That was the series in which uh, these two great works were uh, included. And the, the author, the person who did the slimming and stripping down, was called Jeannie Lang, who happened to be the daughter of a very famous translator of Homer called Andrew Lang. So it's a really good um, pedigree. There are many, many, uh, of course, stories in both those two epics, but the one that caught my attention, I was only eight, we're in 1955, was when Odysseus, having traveled for nearly 10 years to get back from Troy, where he'd been fighting Trojan War to rescue Helen and had devised the wooden horse stratagem. Odysseus is a very smart guy, but he also made some mistakes and he acquired some very powerful enemies, especially the god Poseidon. At any rate, he finally did get back to his native, his home island kingdom. He was a king uh, of Ithaca in the far west of mainland Greece. And he was helped to do this to get back by his patron goddess, Athena, who disguised him as a beggar. And so as a beggar, he meets uh, his own, his own slave, um, a shepherd and a swineherd. He meets his own former staff, as it were. They don't know who he is. To them, he's a beggar. And he asked them, please take me to the palace. Uh, I'd like to see what's going on there. And outside the back door of the palace, he sees a, a dog, a very, very old dog, tick ridden, uh, flea ridden, neglected, uh, scrawny, um, really at the end of his life, as a matter of fact. And he asks his two servants, um, who is this dog? He looks as if once perhaps he was quite something. And the servants give a great tale about what a wonderful dog Argos had been. And he was actually the favorite hunting dog of his master. You know, Odysseus, his master, the man who was king here, but he's gone away and we, we don't know what's happened to him. And Odysseus sheds a tear and then as he moves away, Argos, it's too much for him. He, he dies. And I was eight, I was reading this, I just broke down in tears and wept for about half an hour. But I so loved the stories, the tales, the thought of ancient Greece. I don't know, that's what set me off on my path. So if you have been listening, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>